dinners, which is what I like. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was a, it was a fantastic experience. I am also looking forward to uh, edge processor and the things that uh, it can do. Uh, I have a I have a, another large customer. I have Yahoo as a customer. I have another uh, a large telco that is a customer, and we are uh, investigating all the things that can be done uh, with Otel and with uh, Edge Processor. Thank Did you. I take too long? No, it's good. <laughs> if I can piggyback off what he said with hands on labs, I'm, I'm just going to plug in. Um, you should. <laughs> Uh, for every day at Thumb, we are doing hands-on labs, exploring different aspects of Splunk, mindless T-stats and data models, but we also go through the basics of stats and event stats, lookup tables, SOAR uh, playbooks, just kind of like 30-minute bite-sized sessions of interesting, unique Splunk topics and features. And best of all, you get hands-on with a lab environment to play around and see how it all works. So definitely worthwhile to drop by and visit. I tried to sign up at that T stats and it's too late. It was full. Um, do people on Zoom, uh, David, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Sauer. I manage the Alliance's relationship uh, with Splunk from Recorded Future. Uh, I did attend Comp, and it's my third or our third comp. And I got to tell you, I loved the energy. It's It was super energetic and uh, lots of lots of buzz. Uh, it was great to be there in person. Uh, we loved talking to our customers and, and our prospects. Uh, highlights for me, for us, were um, attending the keynote. That was fantastic. Loved hearing uh, Surge, the Surge team, Ryan Kovar speak. And um, uh, we also held an underground cocktail party. And I will share the names of the three cocktails. Um, we had specialty cocktails there. One was uh, called Indicator of Compromise. Uh, the second one was in Intelligence Infusion. And the third one was called Emerging Threat. So that's kind of a, a foreshadowing or a, a for what's what Kyle's going to go through. But I'm um, based on the East Coast, so I couldn't be there in person. But uh, yeah, comp was great. Uh, we're excited about the partnership and talking to um, all the customers uh, and joint customers that, that that we had there. It was really great. It was a great show. Thank you. And today's pizza has been sponsored by Recorded Future. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then last, uh, Wilson, do you want to give us your intro? So once... Wilson, you're on mute. <laughs> Wake up, Wilson. Okay. Yes. All right, we're going to go into the announcements uh, of our shared comp highlights and possibly have a break and then uh, hear from the party future. So, um, slides are available. Um, I don't know if I. Oh, um, I don't know if I'm revealing anything, but you can change the URL and you can get the, the PDF or the, or the, uh, the, booth, the recorded sessions. Um, if you are interested in giving a talk at a future meeting here, please contact me. Um, and then also just sort of a reminder, we do have a Slack channel on Splunk's uh, community Slack. So um, please join it. So, um, and then I, I was looking at the schedule. We're going to skip in September, um, possibly do uh, a virtual one, maybe in the middle of the day. So it's not in the evening, a virtual one. See how that goes, just mix things up a little. And then November 1st, have another in person one here in the evening um, in San Jose. That's the schedule so far. All right. And then here are the, the highlights. Okay, so for me, this is my team. Um, so uh, this is most of my members. Um, so uh, my manager, I had never met my manager in person. He's in the red shirt um, and he's in, based in Houston, uh, Sherrick. 
And uh, to his left in the blue shirt is Paros and he's in Seattle and I had never met him in person, it was great. Wilson is on the channel, he's, uh, he's in the Bay Area but he's joining remotely right now. He's uh, to Sharks right and then I am. So it was great to have everyone, to, um, most of the group together. Um, and then uh, uh, the other photo uh, is with me and um, some of the Splunk Trust people. If you don't know about Splunk Trust, it's like the MVP of the Splunk community. And there aren't very many women in the group. There's 70 of us and I don't know, maybe six, seven women. And that's four of us there. And uh, that was at the party. It was a lot of fun. So it, the community get together was really great. Seeing people on my team, getting to talk to Martin, um, you know, getting to talk to the Splunk Trust people, uh, getting to talk to other people that are using Splunk um, at the sessions and stuff. It was just, it was really good. Like, like it was said, David said, the, the vibe was very good. Yeah. I guess we should have a new tagline, Splunk, getting people together. <laughs> It was great. It's just really good. And I mean, I'd walk around and I'd see Splunkers that I've worked with for various projects over the years. And it, it was just, it was a good, it was great. Yeah. And Ricky, can you tell people how they can join the Splunk Trust? Like, um, well, you know, you have to be active in the community. So we look to see if people, um, some people are user creators, which I have. Um, are people answering questions on answers? I, I try to do that. Um, are you, uh, do you publish? Uh, you know, so it, it's some of that. Are you answering questions on Slack? Um, so, um, I, you know, I, there's a few channels that I join on Slack, especially like the upgrade channel. Um, and uh, it's a lot of useful. So I, um, I, you know, I try to contribute that way, or people have bugs and answers. And I, I you know, I, I try to uh, replicate their bug and confirm, yes, that you've actually hit a bug, whatever it is, or, or try to answer those answers. Thank you. And the way you can spot one of these trust numbers is when they're wearing their hat. <laughs> the fence. Yes, the we go around and comment, oh, there's a fence. Yes. Yeah. All right. So that was my the community part, but of course, it was also about technical content. So I picked out just a few things. Um, the, there's a talk, if you ever wanted to know about breach, um, Ryan Wood, who's a Splunk Trust member, gave a really good step by step by step. You know, here's here's the ground basis. Okay, now you understand that part. Here's the next, you know, and you kind of like, you, you get to the various levels of learning how to use breach, um, which is uh, it's a really good, um, really good talk. Um, to, uh, to other Splunk Trust people, they, they called it the regex games. Um, so Clara and Corey, and they had kind of like a um, game where uh, it, there was a little app and you had to solve the regular expressions. And you said, you know, I'm at this level. And then um, they had prizes if you solved your, your regular expression task. So they're gonna turn that, the idea is they're gonna turn that regular expression app into, a, uh, into an app. And then maybe we could have it here. Maybe I could have it at Yahoo. Um, so uh, it, 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 that was uh, actually a lot of fun, like designing my people into that. And then the other one um, that I found was really interesting is Splunk uh, has this thing called Innovation Labs. And you go in there and you're under an NDA and they show you things that may or may not be future products. Um, and they take your feedback. Like if we offered this, what, what should we add or whatever? Um, I'm always interested in admin stuff. Um, because we have such a big, Yahoo's a big customer, and we have a lot of users, and they had a, an interesting app that may or may not come out in the future, um, but it helps you, for example, um, you know, uh, show reports that never have any results or that kind of stuff. And we've we've spent a lot of time thinking about that and highlighting stuff that could be cleaned up because there is so much stuff that will need clean, cleaning up over time. So that was in the innovation lab. Um, these are some of my highlights. Uh, first, Splunk AI Assistant. Uh, where can you find it? It's on Splunk Base. Uh, it's an app. What is it? It's nothing but you give an English command or you tell Splunk, this is what you want to do, and it returns the SPL for you. So, hey Splunk, almost like your Siri, hey Siri, or hey Splunk, I want the top five users who are uh, visiting this website sorted by their account and their name and uh, in ascending order, whatever. And it does 
uh, return that SPL for you. So I think it's really neat for new users who are onboarding on your team. Uh, sometimes learning a new language can be hard. So that sort of, sort of cuts the onboarding time and people can get ramped up on Splunk. Um, there was some concern that um, it's OpenAI, is data gonna leave my organization? Um, is it safe to use this app? Yes, um, this app goes on your search head and any data that you search this or you put into it, it's not gonna leave your Splunk environment. Um, having said that, we do tell you that do not enter any sensitive data into this. On the, on the command, like don't enter any PII or sen sensitive data, but rest assured, like even the documents say, no data will leave your Splunk in line. So that was my first highlight. The second is edge processor. And some of you said you're too, you're also excited about this. Um, I'll be honest, like there has been a really long time um, where we've gone without, or there was a big gap where we didn't have a feature like this where we could mask, route, and filter data and some third party or some other companies took leverage of this. And it's about that damn time we start our own feature, right? So I'm excited about this. Um, but yeah, uh, it's really good because if your organization is concerned about compliance and data leaving your on-premise, this exactly does that. Like it will not leave your on-premise uh, before you've done the masking, routing, whatever, filtering, only then you can send it to the cloud or you can keep it on prem. So it's pretty neat, check it out. Um, it's, it's generally available today and it's free. Um, open telemetry collector, any all observability users here? Okay, so this is awesome because this is just an app that you can push on your deployment server and have metrics from your virtual machines, Windows machine go right into observability without having to do deployment and uh, figure out GDI. This is pretty neat. Just put the app on your DS and it'll start capturing metrics from all your on-premise uh, environments and send it to observability. And then finally, federated search for ST. Uh, Sammy, do you wanna talk about this one? Since you said you were excited. Oh, yeah, um, I would describe it as slush search. So instead of indexing on Splunk, you can grab data that you had archived for, say, the last year. And if you're doing like a <clears throat> security investigation now, you can go back with an easy way to correlate all the incidents that you need to uh, find without having to rehydrate it spin up the search head and search that or go through and select the buckets that you need to get back from our, our um, active archive. So it's a really convenient tool and allows you customers now, literally you can data tier your uh, data, like have active search, modern search, slow search. <laughs> Gives you guys, you know, a, a plethora of, because the what we hear from our customers like, hey, it's great to have my data, but like I need some vehicle to search my old data, but I don't want to pay for a hot storage. So it's a great avenue for them. Um, that's we'll have more information on that, or like if anybody's interested in pricing that hasn't been announced yet. It has or, or yeah. Soon. Soon. Yeah. Theaters. Yeah. Anybody else? Any comments? Okay. Well, those were the highlights um, that I thought were pretty interesting. Okay. Um, moving on. What? Should we record this? Is this being recorded for the future? <laughs> Is that what you're trying? Nice. <laughs> I know you've heard that before. It's never. 
No. <laughs> it's my terrible sense of humor. You know you're a dad. Oh. <laughs> All right, yeah, so really appreciate just even being invited to a group like this. Uh, it's good just to kind of get mind share and everybody can kind of knowledge share and learn from each other. But really, we're part of Future does no marketing. You may never heard of us. Uh, we are also a giant company that has over a thousand, uh, over 1600 customers, 40 nation states that are using us uh, from the free world nation states. Uh, but we are a threat intelligence company. So I've got a short kind of slide because I mean, really, I think I'm, I'm a sales engineer myself. Uh, I came from an MSP background, right? Did consulting in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I feel like every time I have the conversation, they maybe have heard of us, but they kind of think they have a definition of threat intelligence. So we have to level set on every single opportunity that we get to talk to people. Uh, so threat intelligence really to recorded future is, you know, I've got this quote here from one of our customers, but we want to leverage intelligence of data, which I'll help to define shortly, as a way to kind of speed up some of the things that you may already be doing on a, as a security team. Uh, and a lot of that's just reputation scoring. A lot of that's context around what is this thing that I'm looking at, this IP address, this domain, this hash, this URL, you know, this vulnerability. Like, I'm going to go out and, and, you know, research this information before I feel like I have enough information to make a decision on what to do next. That's pretty much the way that we've been interacting with information since the dawn of the internet. I've got a question, I ask the question, and when I have enough information that I feel confident to make a decision, I'll take a next step. So for us really, you know, it's important that we harp on the point about, this is not just about IOCs and detections and alerts. <clears throat> so some customers will come to us kind of looking for a threat feed, and that's generally first people's uh, kind of interaction with threat intelligence in general. And threat feeds can come from any variety of sources. You've got a list of IPs that someone says are bad. Um, you probably then have to do further research to say, well, why are they bad? How recently did you see them? You know, it's like trust but verify, which as users, we all do day in and day out. So for us, threat intelligence is really something that is truly actionable because we are collecting and indexing this data. We are the largest data aggregator that's commercially available today. We've been scraping the dark web, clear web, technical web, non-technical sources, open source intelligence. We've been doing this for over a decade. And we've been indexing the data, maintaining a graph database. And this is allowing customers to take our data and put it somewhere that then they can act on it. And really, you could also just use our SaaS platform. We have a SaaS platform that allows you to do research, allows you to look up an IOC or some entity, a person, an organization, a company, we do this across a bunch of different risk domains. So we are enabling GRC teams as much as we're enabling SOC teams. We're enabling uh, external stack surface management teams as much as we're enabling even marketing teams who are looking at digital risk protection. We're the only threat intelligence company that does this across all the domains. And we feel like that's really important for connecting the dots between these threats. Something coming out of Russia-Ukraine conflict that might be aligned to our geopolitical intelligence arm can have real direct influences over the security team who's looking up an IP address that comes across their SIM tools like Splunk. Since we've collected all this data, it's really not just this big hunk and massive thing that you have to ingest. We are then also classifying the data with natural language processing. Uh, that's kind of looking at negative sentiment, positive sentiment, the, the aliases around, you know, the word attack, we also are very well trained on cyber lingo with the threat actors themselves. You know, like nobody says poning anymore, right? So, I mean, I do, but <laughs> we have also leveraged large language models recently. I think we shipped around March where we have licensed the GPT-3 language model to run on recorded future environments. So this is, we're a purely SaaS product. We are agentless. We just want you to give you our data. A lot of the customers are going to look something up and they're going to want a summary about, well, why do I, what do I need to know about this entity? We've trained GPT-3 to write like an analyst. So we have an internal research arm called the InSeq group. They've been writing finished intelligence reports for over a decade. 
We trained GPT-3 how to write like an analyst so it can speak professionally, summarize professionally. And it's also all within our walled garden. So we don't have uh, API calls that are kind of reaching out to chat GPT. Uh, we fully licensed the model and we've kind of trained it all in-house on our data and our language model. Since we have all this data, you know, uh, we've got some strategic leaders who remind us to tell people, well, so what, right? Like, or to ask that question, like you've given me all this data, now I have a bunch more info, what do I do with it? And so really what well, you're looking at these, these little models here on the left of the screen is your traditional intelligence cycle. And this is something that comes out of the intelligence community at large, but you've got collection processing, analysis and production, and then you're really giving that to somebody and then they're gonna do something. We, through machine speed, so through AI, through machine learning, you know, natural language processing, these ontology matches to match the context behind something, we're really shortening that collection and processing part. We have all the feed data. We are reaching out to Twitter. We are reaching out to uh, open source news websites. We are collecting from information sharing partners like Cisco Talos, FBI, et cetera. All of that collection is done by Recorded Future and all the processing to connect the dots to make the determinations of why something is risky. So that then your analysts who are looking at an alert in Splunk or doing an ad hoc search on research on some specific IOC, they're just focused on like, why do I care about this? How does it matter to my organization? And then, you know, what am I gonna do with creating maybe an internal document, an internal report, executive brief, you know, what, whatever it might be. Really freeing up the analysts, that whole like, Google search, Bing search, reach out to the web, you know, look for more context. We are really automating that for all of our customers. We've got the data in many places. If you've got feeds that you're already subscribed to, so are we, so get them all in one place. This is a short slide just on some of those kind of existing workflows that Splunk customers are really harping in on now. You know, they want to prioritize their alerts. What are the things that we should be looking at first because they are the most risky? Recorded future will tell you why, but also you can begin to rely on our risk scoring to tell you these are your you know, P1s and these are your P2s and everything else is something you can action at the end of the day. We are automating a lot of these things. So the reputation lookups, all this stuff is completely kind of solved for you with our Splunk app. And then investigations and strategization. You know, can I dive in deeper? Can I kind of use this Wikipedia of threats to pull out the thread and figure out more and kind of follow the threat actor across infrastructure? Can I follow the infrastructure to see where it's been in the past and where it is currently? And then ultimately strategizing is, you know, what are you going to do about it? Uh, how are you going to field this issue? Are you going to send something up for an incident lead, an incident response team? Are you going to kind of log something as informational? And now you know that you have a good amount of data to say this actually wasn't an issue for our organization, and we can safely de-emphasize some of those priority tickets. This is a short table just around kind of uh, you know, the key things that Splunk, are, Splunk is doing around building security foundations, unifying security operations, how Recorded Future is really mat matching that and enabling those workflows, and some of the integration alignments over on the right-hand side that we'll show in a short demo as well. Uh, but we are compatible Splunk Enterprise, Splunk Cloud. We have Splunk ES offerings. We also, uh, Splunk SOAR, you know, we are really fully enabled and have a really rich partnership with Splunk to make sure that we are just accelerating the workflows of your analysts today. We want to keep them in that pane of glass. They have existing workflows. They have SPL that they love, you know, and this is kind of our mantra, not a mantra, just our kind of our philosophy is just keep your analysts doing what they're good at. Just give them faster tools, give them more gas for the car that they're already in. We have a few data sheets. I'll share this out uh, with the group, this the slide deck that I'm presenting on now. But yep, we're available on Splunk Base. We have some uh, case studies from existing customers who are utilizing Splunk, you have Splunk Cloud, Splunk ES, et cetera. Uh, those are nice little reads. But ultimately, you know, I think um, what I'm really excited to show you is just how it works. So I'll be getting into the demonstration and before that, looking at a bit of just the recorded future data and then how much parity we have in the Splunk app itself is, I think, uh, an important distinction. So recorded future has a SaaS app where, yeah, you've got like alerts and monitoring and all this mumbo jumbo that I don't need to teach you about, but we've got ad hoc searches. And ultimately, I want to show you our data because that's what we're trying to give Splunk users is all of our data and mass. So you're looking at an IP address lookup. 
uh, you know, I want to learn more about this IP, something comes and I want to make a correlation of Splunk, or I just want to do a research. What you're looking at in the way that I kind of read this data is how many references does recorded feature have to that data set, to that indicator of compromise? How many times has it seen it? You know, your risk scoring, how big is the sample size of the data? Uh, how most, how recently has that data been seen? So am I looking at like stale references? Am I looking at something that's more up to date? And what we do is we match those references in our intelligence graph against things that we're calling risk rules, which are really just like technical or behavioral indicators of risk. We use all this to kind of roll up this risk score that gives you this zero to 99 reputation scoring on how critical something is. There's banding and there's weights within that. But the risk rules are really the context as to why something was risky. So if you scroll down, which I'll do shortly, you'll be able to see the risk rules individually. But this here is that kind of uh, large language model summarization. So anytime you look something up in recorded future, very quickly up to the minute, you're getting a flash report written by an AI analyst. And this is somebody who you know, is an AI model that's been trained on how to write like a threat intelligence analyst. So you're really getting the, the professional decorum, uh, the syntax, the flash reporting abilities of a senior analyst, but you're getting it up to the minute. And if the data changes, recorded future is scanning things and updating our intelligence graph minute by minute. And so too are these summaries. These summaries are generated the moment that you make the query. So this is you know, the most up-to-date summary of why something was risky. And it's really summarizing these risk rules below. So I've gotten kind of uh, you know both of these on screen here, so you can kind of compare the two. But essentially, you know, something might be historically reported as a command and control server. We'll tell you how recently that has maybe been seen. We'll tell you uh, if it's linked to intrusion methods and how many different sources. You know, who is this coming from? Essentially, can also affect the reputation of the indicator that you're looking at. So we say, okay, some guy, somebody on Twitter mentioned uh, that this thing was risky and maybe only once, so kind of a, a lower weighted option. But also we have you know, validated information and also information coming from more trusted partners like Department of Homeland, Homeland Security. So these different things of different weights, but I also really wanna dig into this one here, recently communicating validated C2 server or command and control server. So this IP address was, seen as a botnet, but recorded future through proprietary analysis has actually reached out and validated that that indicator is still active. Or if it's recently, that means it's no longer active, but it was previously. So you get this point in time reporting about how something was risky. But I think in most importantly, you're getting uh, some victim information. So we've had multiple communications observed between the victim on five different ports you know, aiding your threat hunting or your incident kind of triage. It's important to know if you even have the same port combos that are getting hit. But I like this one too, which is like uh, this host name recently resolved to the suspected victim IP. So through some of our telemetry, we're also able to say, unfortunately, you know, this individual who subscribes to kind of a remote access tool for Synology likely has had their Synology compromised, their NAS, and their data <clears throat> may be out there in the wild. You know, we really don't know the impacts, but we do have multiple pieces of context that allow us to kind of pivot our search and kind of add to the context of what should I be looking for in my Splunk environment. Few other options, few other examples, uh, another IP address, but the same idea, you know, recently validated, uh, attributed to specific malware variants. This is really the power of threat intelligence is that contextual mapping. It's not just, hey, we saw this thing and it maybe might be risky. It's recorded future saw this, we tested it. Here are all the other ways that you can kind of come at this IP address either through a host name, but also here's some unfortunate victims. And this is even the malware variant that was detected and fingerprinted once we validated that specific indicator of compromise. Everything in recorded future is clickable. So this is like a bolded item. I don't know much about Warzone Rat. I didn't prep and look at this malware variant. But that's kind of the beauty of recorded future is I don't need to remember all million different malware variants and every permutation that threat actors create day to day. I don't need to keep you know uh, my eyes and ears everywhere everywhere all at once. Recorded future just gives you the same type of speed to knowledge that we first started getting when we implemented search engines to begin with. 
just like, I have a question, I need confidence, I want to do something with the information that I've been given. So that's, I think, the power of our data. It's dynamic, we're providing risk scoring, we're validating a lot of these IOCs. Uh, we kind of operate across various risk domains, but here today I'm uh, prepared to talk to you about our Splunk app. And this is really where we're getting, I think, the most value for our analysts and a lot of the time savings that our customers are getting. As I mentioned, we're available via the Splunk base. So we had uh, one of these IPs earlier, right? So this was like Cobalt Strike, C2 server. Uh, it's on some different lists. You know, it's got a risk score. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this IP just into my clipboard and just show some of the parity that we're providing between this screen, which is a, you know, SAS requires a seed, et cetera, versus the parity that we're providing in the app. So I'm kind of launching the Splunk app, reported feature app for Splunk. There's a bunch of different uh, mod, kind of the little tabs that we've enabled. But here, I'm just going to look at some IP enrichment tabs. So regardless of if we've got alerting that's getting fired or whatnot, I might just have a general question around something. And the same type of information we are exposing to our SaaS app, we are also exposing to the Splunk app. So here I've done a lookup. I'm getting that same type of risk score, you know, that kind of uh, speedometer. Uh, it's telling me how many risk rules were triggered, you know, how recent is that data, the same things I was showing you earlier. But all of those risk rules and, and kind of the re related technologies, the related uh, malware variants, these are also exposed to our Splunk app. Kind of coming back to what I said earlier, I want to keep analysts <clears throat> in Splunk. I want their eyes here. I want them triaging alerts. I want them very quickly just to kind of going, not hopping between screens. Uh, they are building workflows to just look up information, get details, find the context behind the risk, and then move on. That's you know really what we want our analysts to be doing. <clears throat> I think some interesting uh, additions also, like we will show some neighboring IP addresses. This can kind of aid some additional threat hunting or um, proactive blocking if you send this down a ticket. So hey. You know, this appeared in our logs and I'm going to send up a ticket for incident response or for somebody to remediate. Um, but then also maybe consider the rest of the IPs in the slash 24 that also have some level of risk to them. You're not just protecting against the one thing you have seen. You're also helping to protect a wider net to be more proactive against the things that are neighboring as well. That's an ad hoc enrichment, but really where we are all in with automation and kind of uh, speeding up the actual automated triage that junior analysts right now are, are, are hamstrung on is gonna be a lot through some things we're calling correlations. So within the reported future app, it is correlating uh, indicators you have in various indexes across various risk lists that we are ingesting into, report, into Splunk. So recorded future is maintaining these risk lists. They're dynamically updating. It contains the top 100,000 or top million indicators of compromise across different uh, IP addresses, domain hashes, vulnerabilities, and URLs. But ultimately, you never want to see a dashboard like this because this is a demo environment full of honeypot data. <laughs> but uh, you know, you've gotten over 2,300 recently reported C2 servers. So these are like the indicators of compromise in your indexes that are matching certain risk rules. And each risk rule really tells a story, right? So something that's a validated command and control server is a much different story than something that is uh, related to recent phishing. And the ways that the team is going to remediate that potential security issue is very different. So you're no longer just saying, hey, it's, something's risky and somebody said it was bad a long time ago on this list that I found on the internet. It's more, this is up to the minute intelligence that says that this is currently a command and control server, or this domain was kind of uh, monitored as a phishing post yesterday. These are all to totally different pieces of context that aid and also speed up not only the analyst workflows, but also downstream workflows for uh, incident response leads and you know just kind of overall remediation efforts. I'm exposing some of the uh, kind of uh, configuration here for correlations, just to show you an example of some of the additional risk lists that are ingested. And uh, I definitely should have prefaced this by saying I am not a Splunk master. I'm not a Splunk expert. 
Like my favorite tea stats are how many cups of black tea I drink in a day. So, <laughs> but we, you know, you pick your indexes and, you know, various different risk lists that we're ingesting. I'll just pick IPs, for example. These are maintained by Reported Future and are ingested as uh, lookup tables within Splunk. This is really important to our customers who we know are you know, pretty concerned about their uh, ingestion rate and the amount of data that they're containing. So not only are you getting this mass of data that Reporter of the Future has been collecting over the past decade, it's something that's not affecting your Splunk spend. And so it's a very quick and easy win to be presenting the customers who are looking to maybe kind of uh, upskill some of their junior analysts. So I got a question in the back. How, uh, how often are the workups updated? Right, so these are updated hourly. So each of these uh, lists on the recorded future server are updated hourly. However, our underlying data is minute by minute. So if you're running an ad hoc search and that like IP enrichment, domain enrichment, you're getting an up to the minute look. And if you run a query or you run something, you know, you're checking it against the risk lists which are updated hourly. That's a good question. I like showing this though, because I think I you know, mentioned earlier, certain indicators of compromises in certain sets have different stories and different impacts. So if we have like an entire IP risk list that is dedicated to indicators of compromise related to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, then we can answer very quickly some of those executive drive-bys like, oh, do we have any issues with Russia and our systems? You know, like, I think executives ask, ask broad stroke questions like that and you can have a dashboard that goes, yeah, look, no, we're good. Um, similarly, like spam and phishing might be a separate team that, that kind of uh, fields these alerts than the teams that are looking at like C2 botnet activity, et cetera. So we have really built this with the operational mindset of your of analysts and of security teams around the world. And so a lot of these things um, have kind of been carved out. However, we can also build you custom lists because Recorded Future has this massive data. We can create custom lists that you could ingest directly into Splunk that might tell whatever story you're trying to defend against. Uh, we've got some customers who uh, are really interested in like logs on their customer facing infrastructure. So they may be like a consumer product and they're really interested in customers who are signing up for their services through a proxy. So Recorded Future has data on all the IPs that are tied to proxies, you know, the retail ones, the, the non-retail proxies, <clears throat> what type of proxy servers are behind. And now we can help our customers have a dashboard that says, in Splunk, here are all the user accounts that you have recently signed up in the last 24 hours, but these are the ones that come from NordVPN. These are the ones that come from Surfshark. You know, here are the ones that come from uh, you know, WireGuard or something. So that is really the, the proof in recorded future is just the deeper we can get into the context, the deeper we can get into the, some of those risk rules, the more we're able to enable whatever protection angle different customers are trying to achieve. So the alert section here is just a quick, a quick snapshot, but really the things that happen in those correlations. So right now we're still just in Splunk Enterprise. None of this requires ES. Uh, this is gonna generate kind of a basic alert that says, hey, we saw a correlation between something you had in one of your indexes and something that occurred in the recorded future intelligence graph. So these alerts very quickly without having to even click through them can be uh, just really triaged very quickly. The highest things based on that risk scoring are going to be bubbled to the top. But you know, what are those risk rules? What are things that are malicious? How many risk rules, et cetera? That quick viewpoint is just right here within the alert itself. And then you could, you know, just triage it and move on, add your notes, et cetera. So I like this idea just to kind of keep analysts moving. There's like a you kind of get into a flow, and we don't want to get people like stopped up and have to figure out what they're actually looking at and do a bunch of research and a bunch of different panes of glass. We want analysts just to bang through the things that are riskiest and then field them off to the teams that, that are most necessary. Yeah. Can these alerts be bubbled up to incident review? Yeah, so in ES, the, we'll, we'll go over that next. Okay. They can also get bubbled up into incident review. Yep, question in the back, Mark. So what I think you're showing is a workflow inside the app. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so the notes that are taken, did you ask about notes up there? Um, uh, how does that persist like in the workflow here? 
Yeah, I'm not super sure, to be honest. Um, okay. Given that like, I don't actually work in a SOC and I haven't had to like plug these out and, and see what happens to them. Okay. Uh, I know that the alert object can then be passed into downstream systems if you have things collected, but you know, I'm not sure exactly any specific user uh, customer use cases. No, that's cool. I, I just, I see a workflow I'm trying to. Yeah. I, I have customers that um, have a security um, uh, task that they don't have ES. Right. So when I think about it, I think, and this is exactly where you're at, is that I need a workflow. I might have security essentials that is part of Splunk as an app, and I could have this as my threat intelligence feed. Those two things together would make a good workflow and not have ES. So that's yeah. why I asked what I'm, yeah. that's we'll perspective. We'll move into ES pretty shortly, um, yep. because there are definitely some things that are like, killer inside of ES, um, but it's the flexibility, right, that, that mm -hmm. allows our customers, depending on where they're at today, and then how they want to grow. Yep. Uh, the thing I wanted to pivot back into is that we've enabled a recent feature called Collective Insights, and so you could take a lot of your correlations and a lot of the things that are occurring, those alerts that I showed, like, okay, these index items match these recorded feature indicators of compromise, and they can be flowed back into recorded feature to give you some automated MITRE attack heat mapping. So out of all of the context behind why this thing was risky, can we then also deliver like, you know, what are those TTPs that we should be pro proactively really driving home in terms of protections? Which ones should we be prioritizing because we are actively getting these attacks or these events inside of our environment? So this is less of like, um, you know, a CISO deciding how we should drive the program based upon what they've done in the past and much more a data-driven, data-informed security decision where we've moved our kind of security posture to risk intelligence-based, uh, really using the true data that's already in a lot of your, your Splunk clusters. You can dive into these. Uh, and so there is some like uh, understanding more about uh, where, you know, what T codes came out, what specific uh, ingestion point this came from, because this could be coming from Splunk, uh, Enterprise, it could be coming from Splunk SOAR, it could be coming from pretty much anything. Uh, and so a lot of that data also helps to determine where you know, those correlations were made if you were to kind of dive back into reported future. But you can do the same thing inside of Splunk. So backing out of the recorded future app for Splunk and then maybe going into enterprise security, we also have some native features inside of ES that I really like. Um, and so for one, it's just kind of yeah, that, that incident review information. Let's say uh, twofold, either you've generated an incident for incident review and you'd like some enrichment, we can absolutely do that in, in the app. But also we have risk-based alerting and we're really supporting the Splunk risk-based alerting feature. So if you wanna set up specific alerts based on only a subset of risk rules, that's absolutely what we're able to do. If you wanna set a threshold for only fire an incident, if you know, it's this type of IP address or domain hash, and it has this type of context behind it, we can support those workflows and really supercharge and accelerate the risk-based alerting features within Splunk ES. So the enrichment all happens here, you know, the, the deeper logic that really allows you to create these automation workflows, that's where uh, our context is really enabling that to happen. And then, you know, I think I'll, I'll end it here, but finally, uh, a big giant pre-filled dashboard, you know, executives love dashboards, managers love dashboards. So it's great to be like, you know, hey, Mr. Manager, I, I added this new product for Corey Future for Splunk, but also here's this cool dashboard to tell you that why it's valuable. Um, you know, that they don't even read the dashboards, they just look at the pretty colors and they go, yeah, that's why I spent the money. <laughs> so yeah, over, you know, over all of the use cases, uh, these are the things that are pre-built right out of the app. A lot of the correlations, the risk lists are things that we are enabling our customers on day one to supercharge their existing Splunk environments with. But also, as you know, your analysts kind of understand our data, so too do their wheels start turning and they go, I want a, I want a correlation for this, or I want a risk list for that, or you know, I want a, a added dashboard and a risk-based alerting logic flow for this. And that's where I think we've started to get the best win cases, the best use cases and win stories out of our customers is when they start to kind of uh, take what we provided out of the box, but really just build on it. And now, you know, we have really accelerated a lot of their workflows 
we have uh, made their lives easier in terms of the slog that is alert triage. And uh, we are making our analysts make more confident decision -make decisions. And really, I think what most resonates beyond all of the time savings and the you know, ROI from Gartner that comes along with that, I think is the problem around just junior to versus senior analyst mindsets and talent availability. We, through intelligence, have been able to upskill junior analysts. They don't have to know what sources are have high reputation. They don't have to know where to go to look up information. They can kind of get that viewpoint that a senior analyst has internally right within the app and then just keep going. So I like this. Um, I, I have a lot of customers who enjoy kind of their intelligence-led security through Splunk. And, you know, we're just hoping to kind of grow the partnership and find some more Splunk customers who want to integrate automation into their workflows. So that's it for my demonstration and, you know, welcoming any questions. I got my couple in. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, how can one get started? Yeah. Um, you can reach out to me or you can actually even go right on the Splunk face and there are some kind of calls to action right within there. If you go to set it up, you'll get it, but you won't get any data until you talk to the quarter future. <laughs> so so is, is there a POC um, way of, of demoing this in an ES environment? Yeah, we, we do have uh, some POC pathways where absolutely you know, we can give you like this 30 day free trial access to our quarter future. It is uh, sales engineer enabled so that you're sure. not just totally hamstrung to figure it out. Uh, but in many cases, it is as simple as like install the app from Splunk Face, go through the automated workflow just to enter in the, the API key and select what indexes you want to make correlations against. So uh, setup is also extremely simple. I saw in your workflow, well, you showed off the um, I, IP analysis and I saw like URL analysis. Uh, what other kind of values could you toss in there? Like um, API endpoints? Um, yeah, in terms of like the enrichment, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we absolutely can do URL matching. So API endpoints would fall into that. Um, domain reputation, things of that nature. Vulnerabilities is a big one. So uh, I'll share my screen real quick too. The same data that I'll show here uh, is the same data that you could get from uh, the recorded future app for Splunk, but I think I had some vulns. Uh, our vulnerability intelligence is also uh, a really big win story for our customers who are ingesting all of their scan data. So not only do you have like indicators of compromise, you also have this like never ending list of product vulnerabilities and the risk rules and the risk scoring also apply to vulnerabilities to say, um, I think this one might even be one where uh, we are providing like this like risk scoring. You know, we saw something as early as July 25th and as recently as today. Uh, this is a uh, kind of a Ubuntu that game overlay uh, vulnerability that's kind of burgeoning in the news. But we, uh, through web reporting, you know, on day zero of disclosure, are assigning risk scoring. And then as different things appear on the clear web and technical sources, we'll adjust the risk scoring. But the takeaway on this one is uh, here we are kind of uh, bringing in the NIST National Vulnerability Database CVSS scoring into the app. There is no CVSS score yet for this like seemingly nearly critical vulnerability. So on day zero, we are saying like, this is risky, one to 25, 25 to 35, you know, whatever it might be. And we're also giving you the context as to how we've made that scoring and those attestations. So there are a lot of organizations that are kind of not even looking at vulnerabilities until a CVSS has been assigned. And it, you might even be a full patch cycle until you get one where you could have probably operationalized something. Similarly, here's like a, Apple uh, vulnerability where we're giving it like the highest possible score. So the question here is like, why is it a 99? We'll say, well, uh, this is in the CISA known exploited vulnerabilities catalog. So this is an actively seen in the wild exploited vulnerability. But if I scroll down, uh, NIST is only giving us a 5.5. So that's a totally different Delta. You know, you're calling this a medium critical vulnerability. A lot of teams would not really even prioritize patching it. But CISA, a very trusted organization, is saying this was exploited in the wild and we've seen it. 
So you know, it's just different context pieces. And really that's what we are attempting throughout all of our indicator enrichment and uh, IOC type of reporting throughout all of our threat intelligence is trying to give you as much granular context as you want so that you can make decisions based on context clues, not just based on like a, a score of five, you know, one to 10. Cool. Thanks. That's it. That was it. And I'm not taking it home. So yeah, inside, inside me. Ooh, there we go. Thanks, people on Zoom. Thank you. Bye. Um, I think I'll be on the API right now.